Um, my name is John Kenyon. I'm one of the members of the Mortimer History Society, um, which I joined a few years ago, mainly because of the superb range of lecturers they get coming from the, the academic world in Wales and England. Um, my speciality is, is castles, um, which I've been able to develop further since my retirement a, a few years ago. I've been talking here at this conference on how to build a castle, looking at the later work at uh, Ludlow Castle, built by the Mortimer family from around the sort of 1320s, 1330s, but in particular looking at what uh, went on in the castle when it became the centre for the administration for certain areas of Wales and the Welsh marches, and um, the Council of the Marches in Wales, when there was a massive rebuilding programme to improve the accommodation um, in, the, in the 1560s through to the early um, 1600s. And, and that's going to be the subject of, of my talk and the, and the, the tour in the, in the afternoon. So my thanks to Philip for inviting me, um, or should I say twisting my arm, to contribute to this one-day conference on how to build a council. Uh, this year was meant to be a quiet year for, for me to work on a certain chapter for the Mortimer Anthology coming out next, next year to be launched at the Tower. Um, but I think this year sees me back again in October, um, talking on, on Raglan, um, but always a pleasure to come and talk to the, to the society. So with uh, apologies to the Mortimer's home base of, of Wigmore, the two finest castles of the Welsh marches that span the Middle Ages are Chepstow, but in particularly I have to go for Ludlow in my native county of Shropshire, um, so it is appropriate that the conference is being held here. When I began my interest in castles in the early 1970s when working at the Society of Antiquaries of London, it was the castles of the late 11th century through to the Edwardian conquest of Wales to which I concentrated, um, reading all the key books in that library and picking the brains of such scholars as Dr Arnold Taylor and Dr Derek Wren. However, what was being built from the 14th century through to the age of the Tudors, especially the domestic rangers, as well as buildings constructed de novo, is a field that I later found equally interesting. Um, one only has to um, see such structures as Bolton and, ha and Harewood Castle up in Yorkshire, um, or Bodium and Walkworth, Sussex and also Northumberland, to realise the wealth of stunning castles and fortified manors that have survived one way or the other from the 14th century. The emphasis of this talk is, of course, on Ludlow. And this short presentation is an overview of the developments undertaken by Roger Mortimer in the early 14th century, and then moving on to the 16th century. Um, although it is worth mentioning that the 15th century modifications are visible in the Great Tower, as we've learned today, and in the northeast corner of the Inner Bailey, um, an aspect that I will not explore further um, today. So we've got the, the 15th century doorway here into, into the Great Tower and a lot of 15th century work lurking in this area, the Pendover Tower and obviously the back of the, of the, of the Great Keep. Um, developments re relating to the Yorkist held, the Yorkist held Ludlow and the home of the short-lived Edward, Prince of Wales, the future King Edward V, one of the princes of the Tower. It's worth reminding everyone that the branches of the Mortimer family were busy refurbishing long-held castles and others recently acquired at this time, such as Wigmore itself and also Dolvaux in Montgomery in Paris. And in consideration of late 13th century domestic developments as a whole in Marcher castles, one mustn't forget the work at Chepstow uh, by Roger Bigger, the Earl of Norfolk. So to Roger Mortimer, 1287 to 1330, um, later first Earl of March, he acquired Ludlow through marriage to the Jean Villiers Joan, having been betrothed to her in September 1301. Joan's family had transformed the north range of Ludlow's inner bailey with the great hall to the west of which was the Solar. In his important paper in Archaeologia for 1908, William St. John Hope assigned the Inner Bailey North Range to the 14th century, and as we'll see, he was partly correct. In the Loggeston Book of Essays on the castle, Richard Morris dated the Solar and the Hall to the later 13th century, 
though Michael Thompson prefers a slightly earlier date um, for the hall, but I think Richard Morris is, is, is the correct um, dating. Um, this, is, this slide was kind of provided by Philip Hume, who's at Alderton Church, possibly mentioned being Roger Mortimer. Um, in, in the Great Chamber, there's a set of very fine corbels, of which the bottom two of the ground first floor fireplace may represent king and queen. But you also got these other corbels up here. I just wonder whether that is in the upper room is also meant to be uh, Roger Mortimer. What is not in doubt um, is that Roger Mortimer continued the development of the inner bailey with a new range of buildings um, running east from the Great Hall up to the Norman Pendover Tower. The 14th century OG windows in contrast to the wide tracery um, windows of, of the hall. So we have the solar range here and the hall range with the wide tracery windows and here we've got uh, the great chamber of Roger Mortimer and other apartments running that way which we will, as we will see is, have largely been um, sport as it were um, by the later Tudor um, re rebuilding and the addition of a staircase. So here, the great chamber here, and the OG windows here. Those familiar, not familiar with the term OG windows, generally defined as a quote, and I quote, a decorative line created by connecting two curves, one curve concave, the other convex. Now you know all about OG windows. What is not known is whether the Jeanville family had planned a new build in this northeast area, or whether their work had always planned to be finished with the Great Hall. As far as dating is concerned, it's important to realise that Roger Mortimer spent the opening decades of the 14th century on Mortimer estates in Ireland, and it is unlikely that the Great Chamber range was built before around 1320. Ludlow became Roger's main seat, but as mentioned a moment ago, Wigmore was not neglected, uh, as can be seen in the view of one of the Bailey Towers um, with its OG windows here. The Great Chamber contains a suite of magnificent rooms with handsome fireplaces and with access to the Great Latrine Block, um, which is best seen from the outside um, if it wasn't for the um, growth of trees along that side. Whatever Mortimer built between the Great Chamber and the, and the Norman Pendover Tower in the northeast corner is now largely obscured by later developments, particularly of the 16th century, of which more in a moment. The other addition made by the Earl of March was St Peter's Chapel in the Outer Bailey, built to mark, to, give, uh, to mark and give thanks for Roger's escape from the Tower of London in the summer of 1323. Um, so we have here a um, great chamber here, the fireplace, the, the corbels, one of which may have been Mortimer, are situated sort of above the slide here, and the view from the other end here. And just notice a Tudor addition um, to, to the great, great Chamber. And then on the one side you've got the Great Gardro Tower containing other small closets or rooms as well as the latrines themselves backing onto the Mortimer development. Best seen here, there's not a view I think you can really get to see uh, nowadays. You, you can in the winter. John. In the winter, yes, yeah. And then St Peter's Chapel here, um, which is the only sort of firm evidence we have, documentary-wise, for for Roger Mortimer's work um, at Ludlow. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Ludlow Castle was the seat of the Council of the Marches in Wales until the Council's disbandment in 1689 although the origins of the council go back to the reign of the Yorkist Edward IV, and of course the council was in an abeyance in the Commonwealth and Protectorate in the 1650s. The administrative role of this body has left us with a fascinating series of buildings, mainly dating to the time when Sir Henry Sidney was president in the period 1560 to 1586. The council initially had Quote, judicial, administrative, and general surveillance duties over the principality, the semi independent marcher lordships, the county palatine of Chester, and the English counties of Shropshire, Herefordshire, Worcestershire, and Gloucestershire. Um, that's a quote from um, 
the, um, the Dictionary of National Biography entry to, to, to Bishop Roman Lee, Roland Lee. The 16th and 17th century saw a number of fine additions to medieval castles, such as uh, this here at Dudley, which we saw the aerial view this morning in Malcolm's talk, and not forgetting Raglan, which more later this year. The Dudley and Raglan ranges provided uh, halls and private suites for the families. The ranges at Ludlow provided accommodation and administrative facilities for a castle that had a legal role to play in the march. We know that King Henry VII visited Ludlow at least once, and the castle was home to his son and heir, Arthur, from 1493 until his early death in April 1502, and the seat of his council. Just as an aside, if anyone wants to learn more about Arthur, um, his time here, his funeral and its reenactment in 2002 in Worcester, I re really recommend the Boydell Press book, Arthur Tudor, Prince of Wales, Life and Death and Commemoration, published about 11 or 12 years ago. But to return to the castle, as the history of the king's works has shown, no financial evidence survives for the Tudor works on the castle until the reign of King Henry VIII. The cost of almost £12 for a new bridge appears in accounts for 1518-20, to 20, and the chapel or council house outside the castle, quote-unquote, underwent several repairs from 1510 to 1522. Presumably this is St Peter's Chapel in the Outer Bailey. Arthur's sister Mary resided in the castle in 1525 through to 1528, and further works were undertaken with expenditure on locks, tiling, and soldering of windows. In 1526, a large sum, over £500 in the money of the day, was spent on two residences of the council, Ludlow and Ticken Hill in Bewdley, Worcestershire. But most of this expenditure went on the latter site, a large timber frame building of which one range survives from this time. We now come to the time of Roland Lee, Bishop of Coventry and Litchfield, President of the Council from 1534 to 1543, an exemplary administrator in the marches, if you're English, not so much if you're Welsh. For more on Lee, and of course a later president, Henry Sidney, I referred to the document I mentioned before, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Lee inherited a castle that had been neglected, and one that was quote-unquote badly decayed. Repairs included the roof of the Great Hall and its glazing, as well as the two chapels. It is clear that much had to be done to make Ludlow fit for purpose, and even in 1540, Lee mentioned that the timber lodgings in the castle were in a state of collapse. In a letter of 1556, mention is made of the Porter's Lodge, of late newly builded, and the three adjacent prison cells, which date to the same time. There was an inscription over the cells that stated they were built in 1552 when William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, was president of the council. The transformation of Ludlow Castle as a place fitting to house the president and the council when it met came with the appointment of Sir Henry Sidney as president, a post that he held from 1560 until his death in 1586 although during that time he spent a number of years in Ireland, holding the post of Lord Deputy of that country. Sidney's works were to impress Thomas Churchyard in his poem of 1587, The Worthiness of Wales. I quote, Sir Harry Sidney built many things here worthy praise and memory, and goes on to mention 12 fine rooms that have been added to the castle. Amongst the Lansdowne manuscripts in the British Library, is a record of the works undertaken by Sidney, although the opening paragraph mentions works undertaken at Wigmore, roofing a chamber and repairing its walls and stairs. At Ludlow, a new arched bridge was built at the entrance to the outer ward and repairs made to the Porter's Lodge. Peter's Chapel became the courthouse around 1570 with accommodation for the storage of administrative records. The adjacent Mortimer's Tower, which had been transformed from Postum Tower into a, a, a fine room in the 15th century, was also put to use as a store for ancient records, according to Churchyard. The manuscript here um, mentions um, various editions Sidney made, which I just summarised 
uh, in bullet points. And this is um, the view from Dinner's um, book, um, recording them, the Duke of Beaufort's tour of Wales in the, 50, in the um, 1680s. So, Sidney's work included a kitchen, buttery, and larder by the Porter's Lodge that's in the outer ward. Various stone walls to be built, one to enclose a yard for prisoners, another for a wood yard, presumably in the outer bailey. Repairing the Norman chapel, its glazing seating, and adding the coats of arms of the councillors, which we know about um, through the recent heraldic roll discovery. The building of a fair house of lime and stone against the curtain wall by the kitchen in the inner bailey on the west side. Buildings of various stone stairs and construction of glazed windows, wainscoting and eye panelling and flooring the great parlour and adding a great window. The building of a fair and large seat on the north side of the inner bailey, presumably the range abutting the Pendover Tower in the northeast corner. A tennis court was to be built, and a, a conduit house. Um, with lead piping to bring water into the castle for the fountain which bore the royal coat of arms, um, and amongst others, and the water being piped into the garden and various other rooms and onto the town, uh, to the fountain there. So we're here to see a view of the fountain by the Norman chapel. We also know that the heating arrangements in the Great Hall were unsatisfactory, the central hearth causing a fire over Christmas 1579. The smoke exited the hall via a louver in the roof, so a fireplace was created in one of the hall windows on the south side in 1580. The decision being taken in March for, and I quote, the better of avoiding a smoke and the clean keeping of the house, which now for want thereof is very troublesome. So what remains of all this work, the completion of which is marked by the arms of Elizabeth I, um, here, and the arms of Sydney, um, with an inscription and date of 1581 over the inner gateway. So coming in through the, the, the inner gatehouse, the, we've got the, the judges' lodgings on the right, a series of rooms, well-lit fireplaces, central, stair, central staircase. Just a view of the inside. So basically a, a series of well-appointed bedsits. Um, and then the improvements in, include to the, to the later medieval kitchen here. And along this wall here, there's evidence for where this tin, new timber range, uh, part of the new service range, um, was added. And you can see from various openings and fireplaces, um, um, they reused the, the inner bailey curtain wall, but the, tim the all traced of the timber building has gone. Um, and then the, the covered access provided from the great chamber, the main accommodation for the president and senior offices, um, with a gallery um, running from the, the Mortimer great chamber across to the chapel on, on, the, other, on the other side. And this is Chris Jones Jenkins's reconstruction of the chapel in the, in the 16th century. And then the problem with the, with the having a central half fireplace and causing a fire was um, amended by creating this fireplace here um, in one of the original um, later 13th century windows of, of, of the Great Hall. Detailed costings of Sydney's works have not survived, although in 1582-83 the sum of over £487 is recorded for work on repairs and new buildings. The last new building of the Elizabethan age occurred when the Earl of Pembroke had stables built in 1596-7 in the Outer Bailey, um, which is on the right-hand side here. Excuse the poor slide. Um, it's the only part of the Ludlow Castle when I came up in May that was still in shade. Um, built adjacent to the prison at a cost of £574. The stable bore an inscription, which has now vanished, but it was recorded by Thomas Dinley in 1684 in his record of the progress of Henry, Duke of Beaufort, um, the Duke being the penultimate president of the council. Throughout the Stuart period, until the abolition of the council in 1689, various repairs were undertaken, 
although the furniture of the castle was sold during the Commonwealth and Protectorate era. An inventory was taken in 1650 of all the furnishings in the castle, named room by room, around 50 rooms in all, and the value of the goods and to whom the items were sold. For example, the clerk of the kitchen's chamber had two old tables, a chair, two bedsteads, a feather bed, a pillow, a rug, two blankets, four old stools, a cushion, three curtains for the bed, a curtain for the window, and a fire grate. In the little chamber over the porter's lodge, items included a fire grate, a great brass pot, a chair, three stools, rugs, blankets, two small feather beds, a necessary stool, i.e. a potty, and two leather drinking jacks. In the 1660s, when Richard Vaughan, the Earl of Carberry, was president, the Exchequer was informed that over £9,000 had been spent on the castle to make it fit for the council's purpose, and including staff wages, of which £2,218 went on repairs and £1,959 went on furniture. I'm assuming this is referring to the time uh, of Sydney's presidency. We may just have the bare walls and little or nothing in the way of flooring today at Ludlow Castle, but it is surveys such as the one for 1650 that enable us to put some flesh on the bare bones of the walls, walls that were once plastered and wainscotted and hung with fabrics. We have building accounts for works undertaken around 1581, as we have seen, and there is a letter dated April 1631, which provides further information on the distribution of accommodation for those of high, middling and low rank. Taken as a whole, Ludlow is one of the most exciting castles in the UK to study, from its Norman origins through to the 16th and 17th centuries. If by any chance you're not familiar with the castle and its later medieval and post-medieval history, I hope that this talk has awakened interest, so time now to actually explore what I've been talking about, and perhaps any questions can be saved for when we're on site. I should end by, by making uh, two um, major thank yous um, to no individuals, but for two in institutions. Um, one was to British Rail, and the other is to the Meteorological Office. When I was, after I compiled my talk and went through my various slides of Ludlow, which are many, I realised they could have been a bit brighter, um, and I needed, I needed to get up to Ludlow to take some new photographs from the, from the, from the ground. Um, the threat of the rail strike meant I needed to get here as soon as possible, um, and um, I relied on the Meteorological Office to give me some idea what the weather would like be in Ludlow at the end of May. I had, I must say, one of the finest visits to a castle in the best weather conditions and light that I've ever been able to um, visit at any other castle. And I hope, um, even though these areas are not mine, I hope from the ground slides that have, have appeared it get you some appreciation um, of, of the site. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Are there uh, any questions to John? Mike. I may have been asleep when somebody mentioned it, but everybody seems to have skipped over the round chapel, apart from mentioning it just recently. Am I right in thinking that it was Gilbert de Lacey who had it built before he went off to the Holy Land to become a knight Templar? Well, as, as we've heard in Matt's, Matt's talk, it's very difficult to assign um, various parts of the Norman castle to one particular lacy um, or another. That is the general thinking, that it was that lacy who went on a crusade uh, that uh, some years, whose name dates as Scaly, may have built that chapel, but it is certainly Norman and can be assigned to one of the laces, um, and it is probably that one. If you look at the the article in the Logisman book, you'll see that's the theory that's, that's suggested for the date of, the, of that chapel. Uh, uh, if, if I can just uh, add to that, John, again, I'm going back to what Matt said about the difficulties of, of dating uh, and there being different views. Um, what, what you're just saying, John, is that the uh, article in the Logisman book on the Man Chapel 
does indeed conclude that it uh, was built by Gilbert de Lacy uh, in about the 1150s. Um, and as, you, as people will be aware, uh, the construction uh, of a round nave is particularly unusual. There are very few examples in the country. Uh, and the view is that uh, the construction of a round nave was influenced by examples of um, construction that uh, knights brought back from the Crusades. And we know that Gilbert de Lacy uh, had that interest uh, because he did become a Templar uh, and uh, fought in, in, in the Holy Lands. And so that, that in some is part of the argument that it was Gilbert de Lacy uh, who built the Round Chapel because of his uh, connections with the Templars. Interestingly, though, one of the other chapters in the same book uh, dates the chapel to about the 1120s, um, based on some of the um, uh, archaeological and uh, constructive uh, 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 evidence from, from the build. Um, so, yeah, so again, uh, there, there are different views. Um, personally, um, I find it I'm tempted by the Gilbert de Lacy because in the, in, the, um, in the 1120s, 1130s, it was the period when the castle was being contested. Uh, ownership was moving from the de Lacy's to uh, Papist John, Joseph de Dinon. Uh, there was the siege. And so whether there would have been the opportunity to build a chapel in that period, uh, we, we don't know. I mean, what this, what this um, one day comes with, has, has shown, and those involved in castle, castle studies will be fully familiar with it, you cannot answer every single query um, in our medieval buildings and later buildings, even whether a cathedral or a castle. Um, there's just, without good financial and documentary evidence, it is not always possible. Um, those who, who have done detailed studies of Romanesque sculpture in particular are refining dates of particular carved ca capitals and, and corbels, etc. Um, but they, unless you've got really hard documentary evidence, whether in pipe rolls or, or whatever, it is very hard to date things. And, and in many cases, it's down to royal documentation that, that helps us, rather, and as we've seen with the delays at Ludlow and elsewhere, without that evidence, you can't pinpoint um, with any certainty um, who, who built what. Um, often you can just go by, by star, but what, what we do know is that the, the, certainly the chapel is, is Norman. I mean, just hazard a guess that it is Gilbert. Sorry, can I just pass you the microphone, please? Um, just, well, it was just looking at the um, Gargoyle Tower. Was the North West Tower contemporary with that, or was that built? The, North, the, the tower itself, North West Tower, is Norman, but it had a, a closet room or latrine added to it on one side, um, and then uh, which was being used by the, the solar, which was added by the, um, the Yonville. In, in probably in the 1280s at the same time as the hall was, was built. Um, what would be really nice is for the Logiston Book of Essays to go out of print and a real desire to get a, a new edition with colour illustration and, and colour phasing plans, etc., to the, to the style which Logiston now, now produces um, the books. But I think that they've got enough on their plate to deal with at the moment. Uh, yes, I, 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 I know that uh, Logiston has plenty. Uh, however, um, I'll, I'll sort of um, pass that request on to the deputy manager uh, of the castle, who is in the, in the audience, uh, because the, that book is um, one that um, was commissioned uh, by Ludlow Castle. Um, and I think rather than being an independent Logiston Yeah, the la launch of the High Hay Festival then. Um, and um, I think it was reprinted about four years ago, Julie. Um, so it, it, it it's probably not going to go out of print uh, now for a little while because it was printed. The castle had it reprinted um, three or four years ago. But uh, I'm sure uh, Julie's made some notes. And so, yes, uh, when uh, in good time for when the current uh, edition is selling out. Uh, it might well be worth looking at because 
a few people have said to me that um, the number of the articles in that book that now need uh, updating. Yeah. always individual units because uh, the Romans, for example, had communal ones, didn't they? Um, there are examples of uh, communal ones. I think if, if you go to Norwich Castle, it's keep. I think you've got pairs of latrines facing each other with no evidence for a partition in between. Um, I don't necessarily mean they were used by the lord and lady in the castle. They may have been used by um, um, household staff. I think it's at Norwich when, at some stage, when they were clearing out the base of the shoots, they found a lot of dice at the bottom. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine why, instead of reading the Times, you were playing uh, um, a dice game while you were sitting on the latrine doing what was necessary. And what, whilst we're talking about uh, guard ropes, uh, can I just uh, test out another of uh, the stories that my father told me? Which is that uh, is they are caught, a, a toilet is called a garde-robe uh, because obviously uh, that's a, a literal a straight French translation is garde-robe, garde-robe, uh, and that's because uh, with people wearing woolen clothes, uh, which uh, and woolen clothes uh, would be quickly inhabited by mites and itchy and scratchy things, uh, itching you and biting you all the time. Uh, but if you hung your woolen finery uh, above the toilet, then that acted as a, uh, as a fumigator uh, and, it, and it drove all the scratchy, creepy crawlies out of your woolen clothes. Uh, and so better to be a bit smelly than a bit itchy. Well, I think Is that true? That, I, would, I would say no. I mean, going around, <laughs> going around some of the castles where members of the public of today have used latrines um, without using the, the proper facilities, the, the aroma that's coming out from the, the occasional use of these medieval trees would certainly, I certainly wouldn't be putting my fur coat and boots and fur <laughs> in, uh, into that area. Sorry, did it. that's just my personal opinion, <laughs> uh, Philip. And one, one other uh, myth that we will knock, that we can knock down um, which is the bane of my life in, in Ludlow. A um, number of people who tell me that, um, the, that Roger Mortimer built the chamber block and the guard row tower to solve his marital problems um, because uh, in the period after his uh, exile in France uh, and uh, return to England, where he certainly formed a political liaison with Queen Isabella, probably uh, a sexual relationship as well, um, and certainly their enemies put it about that, that they were lovers. And during the period after the fourth abdication of Edward II and the minority of Edward III, the period when Roger Mortimer was the virtual ruler of the country, and the young Edward III visited, uh, uh, visited Ludlow Castle uh, with Roger Mortimer and his mother, now, of course, Joan de Jeanville, who we've heard about as lady of the castle, would have had the best rooms in the solar block uh, on the northeast corner. But social protocol was that uh, she would have to cede the best rooms to her social superior, the queen. Slightly awkward if the queen was also your husband's lover. <laughs> and so the book, the, so the story, which is in a book by a well-known author, no name given, um, is, that, is that Roger Mortimer's solution to that marital problem uh, was that he, threw, he put, built the great chamber block and the guard row tower so that honour was satisfied because the Queen could have the luxurious new apartments in the great chamber block uh, and, they, and, and his wife, Joan de Jeanville, could retain her own, uh, her own chambers and diplomatically Roger slept with the soldiers. <laughs> so it's a great story. It, but, show, it shows great forward planning that this is a regiment you're going to spend five or ten years building a guard road block in a great chamber. Now you're going to be having it away with the, with the Queen of England. <laughs> like, like another myth, uh, Philip. Yes, it, 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 is, it, it, it is indeed. 
Uh, but it's, unfortunately, it is a book by somebody who ought to know better. <laughs> and when I asked him for his reference, he shamefacedly told me that he felt it was too good a story not to put it in. <laughs> but there, yes, there is no evidence for it, and as, and as John has pointed out, it's just completely impractical. So, for those of you who live in Ludlow, please do not repeat that story. <laughs> any, any more questions? Right, well thank you very much again to, to John, and also thank you to Malcolm uh, and, and to Matt. Um, has Matt been able to rejoin us? Oh, there you are. Yes, there you are.